The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. All right. All right. We got all of our notes written out. That's right. I take copious notes for these Friday shows. We got all the notes written out. The week is more or less in review. And it's time for a Friday episode of Fantasy NBA Today. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I am Dan Bespris. This is a hoop ball presentation, also brought to you by our good buddies in Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee Company. Hoop ball.com is the website at Hoop Ball Fantasy is the Twitter handle, and I am at D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. I hope you guys enjoyed the show with Brandon Marcus yesterday. Uh, we're going to try to do that every week. So every week you'll have an opportunity to look at your teams and say, okay, which of the guys on my club can I launch out into trade offers? And the key really is guys that have the perception of higher value than they will likely have. And it's hard. We'll talk about that probably the next time he has on. I, I, I really want to get into, we had to do this one a little bit quicker just because of timing uh, this week on yesterday's show. Uh, next week when we hopefully have, well, I guess it's Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Well, I, I'm not going to plan too far ahead, but provided the next time we have a little bit more time, I wanted to get into why it's actually so hard to pull off a buy low, sell high. There's so many psychological aspects to it that make it extra difficult. But anyway, that is for another day. This is Friday. This is Fantasy NBA Today. You guys know what we're doing on Fridays now because I think most of you have probably been tuning in and hanging out with us for uh, a little bit. But for those uninitiated, this year we're doing something a little bit different on Fridays. We're tying Fridays into Mondays on the show. Because we don't have weekend episodes, no Saturday, no Sunday episodes of the show, there has to be a way to get us ready for what's to come. Normally during the week, we have this little homework assignment at the end of the show. We sort of preview the upcoming night of games. And it's very easy when you do a show every day to make sure each one kind of tied into the last one. It's a 10-game Friday, by the way, so it's a pretty big deal. What we're doing this season now is at the, the, the final segment of the Friday episode is looking at Friday, Saturday, and Sunday's games and basically setting ourselves up with a full weekend preview. Also, somewhat new for this year, although we sort of did this last season in, in a different respect, is I've broken out, I've gone through every team's most recent game played, some of them two most recent games played, and lined up every pickup, drop, hold, and watch list guy that emerged or, what, disappeared, de-emerged over the course of the week. That'll be segment two. And segment one, working backwards chronologically here, is a quick review of what happened on Thursday. Want to start the podcast today by with the same way we ended yesterday's show, and that is a clarion call. I mean, we are shouting it from the rooftops right now. We have a brand new sales division at hoop-ball.com. Bother me. I mean, really. Take a moment and hit me up. I will say the one stipulation is you have to have daytime hours free. You can't do sales at like 9 p.m. Uh, I should say daytime Pacific time hours free. So if you've got some hours in the mid to late morning, if you've got some hours in the early afternoon and you want to get involved on the sales side here at Hoop Ball, that's the money side, hit me up at Dan Bespris on Twitter or send a note to Team Hoop Ball at hoop ball.com. Again, that's Team Hoop Ball at hoop-ball.com. We are continuing to recruit for other positions as well. If you want to get involved with us on podcasting, writing, marketing, social, all that good stuff, uh, every spot, we're always willing to throw good people into the mix. You have to be ready to contribute. But of course, the sales is the new one. That's the one that we're putting out there kind of for the first time officially this week. It's happening, and it is going to power this locomotive and it's a really great way to cash in a little bit as well. So again, at Dan Vespers or email teamhoopball at hoop-ball.com. Thursday's games, two of them, but they were interesting, man. Both games went way over the total. Portland, Milwaukee, uh, those teams put up almost 270 points. New Orleans, Phoenix, they put up almost 250. High-scoring, fun ones, and weird. 
The only team, in my estimation, that didn't get weird on Thursday's card was Milwaukee. Eric Bledsoe had a really big game. He's going to do that a lot with Chris Middleton out. He's just, frankly, going to do that a lot this year. I'm upset that I didn't get more Bledsoe's, because you guys know I wanted him everywhere. And he got off to this slow start, blah, 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 blah. I think I may have even, did I trade him in a league already? Yeah, I traded him in one league uh, in a Miles Turner deal. I'm good with that. I had points and assists to spare in that spot. I needed blocks. Anyway, uh, I love it. I mean, he's he is trucking, hard trucking now after that slow start. Uh, you know, he'll just be top 40 the rest of the way. But the otherwise, on Thursday's card, there was something going on in every game. And I guess you could even extend that to Dante DiVincenzo, who had 16-6 and six in 27 minutes. I mean, I know he's playing relatively well. To me, he strikes me as more of a 14 or more type of guy. He's getting picked up rapid fire. He's also getting dropped rapid fire. Because if you really break out his game, and it's been pretty good over the last two weeks. Basically, since Middleton went down, he's been hovering around, you know, top... 70 top 80 type numbers the 52 percent from the floor not going to hold long term if he's taking all these three pointers uh two steals per game is not going to hold long term but you don't need long term you just need a couple of games streamer guy i'll throw him into the streamer mix but i want to talk about portland and i want to talk about phoenix and a little bit about new orleans but not as much because a lot of their stuff is injury related Portland, well, I mean, a lot of their stuff is injury-related as well. Portland was without Damian Lillard and without Hassan Whiteside. And things got a little kooky. Scal LeBissier played 28 and a half minutes off the bench and had the line of the night with 22 and 12, a steal, five blocks, two threes, three assists. Holy shamoly! On 10 out of 16 shooting, no less. He's going to be getting grabbed in leagues all over the place. I mean, he was owned in zero leagues prior to yesterday, and now he's been picked up and dropped, by the way, in one of my leagues. He's been picked up in three out of my six most important already. One big game. That's all it took. Here's the thing. A lot of his big game yesterday was due to Hassan Whiteside being out. And previously, it's not like he hadn't had any playing time this season. Look at his games. There is legitimately... Two, I would argue, other games that even get on the radar. He was playing some 15 to 18 minutes per game. And he was posting value outside the top 200. So if we all of a sudden think he's going to be a top 50 guy after one big game, I think we've got another thing coming. What I will say is, if we find out Hassan Whiteside is going to miss any sort of significant time, he's a must-grab guy because he's the only other center on the roster. Zach Collins is out. Yusuf Nurkic is out forever, basically. So if there's no Whiteside, it's going to be Scal. Anthony Tolliver seems to be more uh, inclined to slide down towards power forward. He's a floor spacer, so on and so forth. If Whiteside comes back quickly... Most of Scal's minutes come there. He'll probably take half from Tolliver and half from Scal. So now you're looking at a guy playing back down towards 14, 15, 16, 17 type of minutes. That's not enough. So I'm good with it as a streaming option. I'm good with it as we sort of wait on the white side stuff. There's always something going on with him. And, you know, there's always this weird fluttering idea that may or may not go away that white side is kind of a problem. He's day-to-day, so we're not going to read too much into it yet. We did this with Miami for three seasons, basically. We're like, oh, is this the time they finally get rid of Hassan Whiteside? And and it it just didn't. It never really happened until, like, the last couple weeks last season when Bam Adebayo took over. I don't think that Portland's going to be doing that. They traded for him. Now they sort of have to get him in there. Scal's not just going to jump him in a day. Sad but true. Sad but true. Carmelo at 18-7-4 with three three three-pointers, but... Took him 15 shots to get there. He missed a free throw, had three turnovers, did not have a steal or a block. And that, in a nutshell, is why we continue to say Carmelo Anthony points league only. Rodney Hood is a drop, by the way. I know he had a decent ball game, uh, but he had to shoot 100% to get there. Probably not sustainable. Damian Lillard hoping to be back this weekend. Uh, Me too. I have him in two places. 
two important leagues. So please hurry back. That's a big one for your buddy Dan Bespris. CJ McCollum obviously forced into colossal duty here. This is a, a wonderful sell high if you can find someone who thinks that this is going to keep up all season long, but at least he has sort of rehabbed his value back to where he was drafted with a few of these big ones. And he's been playing better. To credit to his credit, he was playing better even before Dame went down. But now with uh, with Lillard out, there's a lot of CJ. A whole lot of CJ. Who's, by the way, averaging 0.7 blocks per game this year. Weird, I know. Probably doesn't hold all season long. Game two on Thursday, New Orleans and J.J. Redick, who's just caught fire now. Once everybody got hurt and he had to play, uh, he's looked awesome. And I have to assume that means he's probably going to keep some of that playing time. I am genuinely concerned that Josh Hart coming back will punch a giant hole into J.J. Redick. He's not going to play 36 minutes and take 14 shots when someone else is coming for his shooting guard minutes. But, and also I should mention, Lonzo Ball was on a 20-minute cap in this one as his minutes come up. Some of those will come from Redick as well as they shift Drew Holiday over to the two. And Brandon Ingram's probably going to play more than 32 minutes. It's just not it's not a, a stellar outlook, but I am glad that we held on to J.J. as long as we did. I We were sort of the one bastion floating around saying, come on, just, just give this a minute. This doesn't add up. Dude didn't sign there to play you know 22 minutes and take six shots. And now we're seeing a little bit more of uh, what we expected. Tons of three-pointers as one of the lone floor spacers on the team. Brandon Ingram played well. I mean, everybody's playing well against Phoenix right now with no Aaron Baines and no Ricky Rubio. Uh, But I'm not that interested in the rest of these guys because eventually they're going to get healthy and then we'll have to sort of reassess the program with Josh Hart, with Julia Okafor, with Derek Favors. Things will move move around a little bit. Jackson Hayes, by the way, I thought he'd have a better streaming game. He did not. And Kenrich Williams had two and nine with a steal and two blocks. He has issues with percentages at times as well. And it's why I continue to call him basically a stream guy and kind of barely that. He has the type of fantasy game that normally I would like, except he can't shoot free throws and he can't shoot from the field. That's rough. The other stuff is there. You know, I love guys that don't score and do all the other things, but they've got to do If you're not going to shoot well, you have to hit more than one three-pointer. And if you're going to miss free throws, well, I don't know. Something else has to be much better. Phoenix is, to me, you know, obviously they're missing guys. No Baines, no Aiton, but that's been for a while. And then no Ricky Rubio lately. And they've gone into a tailspin without Rubio. Now, we sort of knew, right, that there there was almost no way that this team was going to keep up the torrid pace that they had to begin the season all year long. But suddenly now they've lost three in a row. Rubio missed one, tried to play through back spasms, and now missed another one, and they've lost all three. They're seven and four when he's... Actually, did he miss one earlier in the season as well? Might have taken one game off prior. Should watch what I say. Uh, Yeah, I think he missed like the second game of the year, and they won. Or the first game of the year? Does that make sense? Did Ricky Rubio really not play in their season opener? That feels wrong. In any event, uh, since he's been hurt lately, they're 0-3. 7-4 prior to that. Now 0-3. They clearly need him. And when you look at the box score, and when you look at one man in particular, it tells you the entire story, and that's Devin Booker. Devin Booker was having, from an efficiency standpoint, a brilliant season. And he still hit 50% of his shots in yesterday's game. But all of a sudden... Six turnovers to seven assists. The first one they lost to Boston with no Rubio. Five turnovers to only four assists. That assist to turnover ratio that was a little bit better this year because the turnovers were a little bit lower. It flips so fast when there's no Rubio. Now, to Booker's credit, he's still having a great season. He's shooting 53% from the field and 94 at the free throw line. Both of those numbers probably come down. Guys just don't really shoot 94% on ultra-high volume. And for Booker, because a lot of his stuff is shooting, uh, 53% also feels a bit unsustainable. This is a weird thing to say for a guy who's going to put up big, big numbers across the board pretty much all season long. But this is actually a sell-high time for Devin Booker. Those numbers just aren't sustainable. The percentages, they're going to come down. 
And the team has enough weapons where he doesn't have to score 35 points a game. 25 to 28 is enough. I mean, these are good numbers, right? But there's a perception here, in 9-cat in particular, uh, he's much more of a sell high. There's a perception here that he is going to keep this insane shooting pace up all season long, and it's just not going to happen. Maybe he gets a little bit better season over season, but this is nuts. Cameron Johnson had 14 points. He only played 19 minutes. I don't know. People are like telling me I got to go pick him up or something. I'm not. I'm not on board with that. When Ricky Rubio comes back, my question is, how does this all shift? It feels like a lot of his minutes ended up in the waiting arms of Tyler Johnson, who played 29 minutes in yesterday's game. When Aaron Baines comes back, one would assume that those minutes largely come from Dario Saric and Frank Kaminsky, but those two guys didn't really play that much yesterday. They started, but they didn't play that much. Mikhail Bridges saw 36 minutes in yesterday's ball game. Off the bench. He's going to be on and off of rosters regularly. We had, you know, a couple of decent games in a row here, and, and everybody picked him up. Is this the start of something? I don't know. But I am willing to say that if it is, I don't want to be the guy caught kind of with his pants down and miss it. Because we know how good he can be if given any kind of usage. And he doesn't need much, because there's always going to be a truckload of steals involved. So I'm inclined to say, a eh, speculative ad is not a horrible idea on Bridges. You know? Just flip it out there. If it doesn't pan out, it doesn't pan out. But he's a guy that, compared to other dudes floating around right now, he's, to me, one you wouldn't want to miss. There's the upside factor. The upside factor. And that's effectively what happened yesterday. I mean, it wasn't uh, wasn't a particularly busy day, but I thought the games were fairly interesting, just in terms of you know what what we learned from just four teams playing. Two or three of them were uh, pretty intriguing. Guys, don't forget to sign up for the Bruise Letter. hoop-ball.com slash newsletter is the website. Aaron Bruski straight to your inbox. Once a week, breakdown of all 30 teams in the NBA. Again, it is hoop-ball.com slash newsletter. And it's basically, I mean, the thing is growing by multiple hundred signups every couple of days at this point. So if you're not on it, Someone in your league will be. Don't let them get that advantage. And maybe you get lucky and you're the only person in your league that gets on the list. And then you're really cooking with gas. Then you're really cooking with gas. Then you're not competing with the other people. Get You got the thing yourself? Unreal. Hoop-ball.com slash newsletter. Go sign up right now. I want to segue into my uh, obscene list of pickups, drops, holds, and watch list guys. And a couple of them are guys that we just talked about from that Thursday card. But again, I went through all of the team's most recent game, basically dialing back the entire week. Effectively, that's the short version. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Went through the entire week leading up to today's show. And this is what I got. Pickups. We already talked about Mikhail Bridges. It's a speculative one. I don't know that you have to, and if you're in a games cap format, I don't know if you throw them straight into your lineup. Obviously, if you're in an unlimited you know, anybody you pick up goes into your lineup. So he's on the list. Here are the other names on the pickup side. Daniel Tice. And we've been talking... As some of these names, by the way, a lot of these names, in fact, are guys that we've already talked about on the show. But just in case you missed one during the week, this is the rehash. Daniel Tice has won the starting job in Boston. He's playing big minutes. He has basically forced out Ennis Cantor. He got 28 and now 31 minutes in the last two games, despite the other centers being healthy. He should be owned, in my estimation, in all 12-team leagues. Anything that's remotely close to standard. Obviously, if you're in a league that has weird categories, that's a, a different beast. And, and such is the case in fantasy sports. What I say here cannot apply to every single league. But he is standard 12-team worthy at this point. Because when he's out there for 28 to 30 minutes, he's getting 10 rebounds. 
He hasn't even blocked shots in his last couple of games. That's the type of thing that evens out for him as well. He'll get a few of those. He'll get three or four dunks. He actually was passing really nicely in their last game against the Clippers. Had three steals. I see no reason for him to be on waiver wires. I'm a little annoyed that I had him in a couple of spots. I dropped him in one, and then somebody else got him. Got a little bit overzealous when all of the centers came back for the Celtics. Figured they'd end up splitting minutes. Instead, he's jumped out in front. I put Tomas Sadoransky on this list, uh, but he should have already been on a team. You know, we've been talking about him all season long as the guy that I thought would be the one to be in front in that Chicago position battle. And obviously, after a putrid start, he's been a lot better over the last three weeks. Last two weeks, uh, he struggled a tiny bit, oddly. There's a couple games in there that he would like to forget. Uh, but overall, he just does too many things to be aced out all season long. So I do think he believes he belongs on rosters. Jay Crowder, who, as I talked about earlier this week, is now a card-carrying member of the Dan Bespris moniker Thad Marvin line. What is it? No, Marvin Thad line of old guys that just need to see 30 minutes and then they'll have fantasy value and it just doesn't you have to don't even have to think about anything else. Is he playing 30? Great. He's got fantasy value. And to me, he actually could end up being kind of like an eighth round type of dude. He's putting up stuff across the board because he's not shooting. He's focused on passing and rebounding and steals and blocks. And he's number 120 over the season, but by the way, we are officially one month into the year now. Over the last two to three weeks, Crowder is number 85. And I don't see any reason why he can't just sort of bumble along in that territory. Uh, I threw Bogdan Bogdanovich on this list, but that one was obviously from the moment De'Aaron Fox went down, so I don't think we need to go into any more detail on him. Nerlens Noel is the next guy I threw on the pickup list because right now Steven Adams is dealing with something, the leftover issues of that knee contusion. And so Noel has seen his minutes trend into the low 20s. We've talked about this for three years now. All Nerlens Noel needs is 20 minutes. He's a 20 minute or more guy. Every minute he gets over 20, his fantasy value balloons. And so I think you got to throw him in there. He needs to be playing. In all 12 team leagues until we figure out what's going on with Steven Adams. He, by the way, Steven Adams is a hold. You're not dropping him because he's playing hurt. If somebody's just bad, that's a different thing. But we know Steven Adams. He's playing hurt. He's a rebounding monster when he's healthy. And he's just, he's better than this. I put Kevon Looney in the pickup section. I think he's an interesting stash. The Warriors just have nothing right now. So I see no reason why the guy that probably was supposed to be the third or best, fourth best player when the season began, with now the team's number one player out, number two player playing half the time, number three player playing half the time, and then suddenly you're at Looney. What does he even really need to get out of his way? I, I picked him up in a whole bunch of spots just to see what happens. To me, there's just there's there's very little downside. If it flops, it flops, but there's just nothing standing in his way right now outside of his own health. And my last name on the pickup list is Points League Baron Carmelo Anthony. I just had to throw that in there for fun. Drop list. Rodney Hood is a drop. There's not enough usage in Portland anymore. He only took five shots yesterday. If he doesn't make all five of them, it's a pretty ugly line. He doesn't do enough other stuff. And the reason I liked him for so long was that with him basically as sort of the third most shots on the team behind Dame and CJ, or fighting with Hassan Whiteside for that, that was enough. But now he moves behind another guy, a volume guy in Carmelo Anthony. Uh-uh. There's just not enough left. As Bruce, he likes to say, there's just not enough meat on that bone. I put Kenrich Williams in the drop department. It looks like New Orleans is starting to get healthy, and with every big man that comes back, a rebound goes away. It's like every time, every time a big man gets healthy, uh, Kenrich Williams gets his wings. It's the opposite. His value is in hustle stats, rebounding, steals, blocks. His percentages are kind of clunky. So anytime he loses access to some of that stuff, his value takes a nosedive. Dario Saric, I think, is a drop. And maybe I'm maybe this is one where I'm being a little bit impatient compared to some guys where I have a ton of patience, but I've seen enough of his fantasy game now to know that it's just not going to translate. He was a he was a guy that I think the fantasy community 
uh, at large turned into a thing before he was really a thing. I mean, he was fine that second year in Philadelphia with a couple of threes, 15 and seven. I mean, that was pretty good, but he had so much leash there. His volume is likely never going to get anywhere near where that was. And so, you know, you're sitting on 10 and six with a steal that's probably going to come down. Yeah, meh. I pass. I pass. There's more interesting stuff going on out there. Derek White, who's made the drop list now for three consecutive weeks. He didn't even play in their last ball game. He's hurt, but even when he was, he wasn't really playing. I'm not, at this point, trusting that San Antonio is going to ever give him the shot. If they do, obviously you know what to do, but he doesn't need to be sitting on your bench this whole time. I mean, hell, I mean, we'll talk about a couple of San Antonio's guys in the holds and watch list section here, but it's not Derek White. Serge Ibaka is due back either this weekend or shortly thereafter, so that's going to kill Chris Boucher and Rondé Hollis-Jefferson. I'm going to go ahead and call them basically preemptive drops here because any hit to their minutes is enough to knock them off the pedestal. Norman Powell probably never should have been picked up in the first place. I thought he might have an opportunity to do some stuff as a streaming option, but his fantasy game hasn't evolved in years. That was something we talked about last year on the podcast. haven't really talked about Norman Powell much in between there, but he's basically scoring and nothing else. That's always been his shtick, and it's always been why we've been reticent to do anything with him. And then I'm going to do another controversial drop pair here of Tyler Harrow and Goran Dragic. I don't see how there's enough in Miami for those guys to stay above the cut line, because for Tyler Harrow, his value is in volume. He needs to be taking a boatload of shots and scoring close to 20 points a game, and that's just not going to happen. He's owned in 63% of fantasy leagues, and he's ranking 139 and falling. I don't fully understand this one. He just scores, and he's actually floating himself lately with a couple of good shooting games mixed in. Wait till he has a two- or three-game cold stretch. And then with Goran Dragic who, I'll admit, I thought he was sort of the third behind the in these in this pecking order. He's probably number two ahead of Harrow because at least he gets assists. No steals, no blocks, bad free throw percent, high turnovers. He has his own issues, and when Miami gets fully healthy, that's going to take some of his assists away with Justice Winslow running some of that time in the second unit, uh, presumably, not all of it, but some. And any is too much. So I'm out on him, too. And again, standard leagues. He's ranked outside the top 125. I don't see how that's going up, especially as Miami's mostly been hurt at this point. This has sort of been his best chance to put up numbers. Holds and watch list, guys. That's the last two sections on this uh, mega chart. In the hold list, DeJounte Murray. I know he had a rough one the last time out. The Spurs went to a bunch of shooters. How did that go for them? We can all think back. How did the Spurs fare in their most recent game where they took Murray out, basically, of the rotation? Derek White didn't play, and they went to the Bryn Forbes-Patty Mills combo backcourt. Did they get roasted? They sure did. Creamed by the Washington Wizards. Yuck. Spurs, by the way, sit at 5-10. and 10. They are third from the bottom in the Western Conference right now. And it's not as though their schedule has been obscenely hard. It hasn't been easy. But they're 1-6 and six on the road, so they continue to suck away from San Antonio. They're 1-9 and nine in their last 10 ball games. They probably want to get home pretty quick. 4-4 four and four at their own place. I mean, it's rough, dude. They're behind the Grizz. Ahead of the Trailblazers and the Warriors. The Western Conference is kooky dukes. Except for the top, I guess. Lakers, Nuggets, Rockets, Clippers, Jazz. And then you've got, well, the Mavs are actually tied with the Jazz. Then you've got Mavs, Timberwolves, Suns, Kings. Everybody figured the Blazers would be in that mix, myself included, although I did think that they'd be on the under this year. Uh, but not this far under. Yeesh. Anyway, you're holding on to Jante Murray. They need him. They'll play him. Davis Bertans, I don't know if he was getting dropped. I saw him dropped in a couple of spots, but he's a hold. He's good enough to hang on to. Um, they're sort of, I mean, it, he, he's been fine enough. 
he sits right on that borderline. Uh, but yeah, he he should be he should be on teams. Uh, let's see who else we got here. Isaiah Thomas is a hold for me. He lost some playing time to Ish Smith in that last ball game, uh, and I know that his lines have not been as juicy as we hoped. He's kind of settled into a secondary role in the first unit. I liked it better when he was going bananas as the lead horse in the second unit, but he'll be fine. His minutes are trending up, you know, 29, 33, 24, 29 again, and 24 again. He's hitting some three-pointers. He's getting you some assists. Basically, all we're waiting on here is a few more shots. But he's on the borderline. The issue, of course, is we need him to take some free throws because that's a lot of where his value lies. He's not going to get steals or blocks, so there just needs to be a little bit more usage. We're right on the cusp. I don't know if it's going to come, actually. I mean, we, we can't guarantee that it's going to be there, but I'm definitely holding on. Uh, Eric Pascal is a hold. I know he had a, a brutal percentages game that last time out, but he played 40 minutes in a blowout loss. So presumably he's just going to be on the floor forever. Even though I kind of hate his fantasy game, it's all scoring and a couple of rebounds and that's it. It should be enough with the entire team on the shelf. And I'll throw Alec Burks into that mix as well. He has the same glaring, I mean, really glaring issues with their fantasy game. Uh, Burks has probably a little bit of a higher ceiling than Pascal because he'll get you some assists blended in there. But otherwise, they're both looking at the same general issues, which is they need to score to float their value. Burks is getting a little bit of ball handling work that Pascal is not because there are no point guards on the floor for the Warriors. So he's probably the better of the two. Burks over Pascal. And then over on the watch list, I have Kai Bowman, who I've talked about before, is the one I, I kind of hope takes a step forward in all of this. But it's unclear if there's going to be enough time. If D'Angelo Russell is going to be back in two weeks, that might not be enough time for him to actually solidify any kind of role as a point guard. Uh, but of course, if Draymond's out, then they don't have their point forward. So maybe, maybe Bowman can get over the hump. As I've said before, I'm really not rolling with any of these dudes. But again, if you had to, I think you can rearrange the list now, put Burks in the lead seat. Pascal and Bowman are sort of uh, rung behind. It's all ugly. Dwight Powell and Delon Wright are on the barely hold portion of the holds list proceedings. They are both right on the edge for me. Dwight Powell has done nothing with his time on the floor. He's just not involved, which kind of stinks. And then Delon Wright has had his minutes yanked around so much. He's now sitting outside the top 100 after getting just 16 minutes in their last ball game. I think you can probably dump these guys, but who knows? I mean, Dallas, they use a different lineup in every damn ball game, and it all could sort of turn on its head. They've got Cleveland tonight, Houston on Sunday. Almost no chance they have the same lineup for both of those games. It's just hard to know. Like, when is DeLon Wright going to actually get his 25-minute game? So I think you can probably dump. I'm holding just the tiniest bit longer. But, I mean, both of them are, are on kind of like a one more game kind of thing before they hit the drop pile. Terrence Ross, I could put him in the ad list, but we had him in the ad list so many times that I think now we just have to put him in the hold list. He looks really good since he came back from his knee injury. He scored in double figures in all five games, including the one where he was on a 19-minute limit. Uh, 26, 28, 25, 27 minutes in his last four he has trended up. We've called him a pickup. The steals are there. The threes are there. The free throw percent is there. And half the Magic got hurt in their last ball game. So the, the volume is going to be coming up here in the not-too-distant future. Um, he just he looks more like himself again, and he's a top 90 guy since coming back from the injury. So that's pretty much where we thought he'd be. Kind of a 10th man on your fantasy team, but a good one. Kendrick Nunn is a hold for me. I know he didn't have a great ball game the last time out, but again, he's the starter. He's in there with distributor mode Jimmy Butler, so he's going to get shots, and that's what he needs to survive this madness. Miles Bridges is a hold. We, we talked about that uh, on a couple of shows, but I thought it was worth bringing back up here in kind of the weekend review. He was sitting near the top 200. He's had two decent games in a row. 
with a combined five defensive stats and four three-pointers in those contests. If the steals come back, so shall the value come back. Um, he might even be a little bit of a buy-low guy if you need defensive stats, a couple of rebounds, and like one to one and a half threes per game. I don't think he's ever going to get up where everybody was hoping and like burst into the top 50 scene, but I see no reason why he shouldn't finish inside the top 100. He's not going to get dropped. Uh, the name has too much buzz, and he's played a little bit better here lately, but maybe you could go get him for, I don't know, Luke Kennard? Luke Kennard's value is evaporating. By the way, he's in the hold list. I should add that. Kennard is is one of the guys I was about to talk about in the hold list. He's still number 79, but look at some of his recent games with the Pistons uh, roster healthy. 5, 14. The volume just isn't there anymore. He needs more opportunity, but he's definitely still a hold. He profiles as an end of that first 100 type of guy. It's just that you know, the 17 and a half to 18 points and three three-pointers is probably not going to stick. And he doesn't get steals or blocks anyway. So again, he's one of those guys where if the volume isn't there, you drop fast, like a boulder. The guys that do all the other stuff, they can withstand fluctuations in volume. The ones that are basically all scoring, they can't. Dylan Brooks is on my hold list. He's been super inconsistent, which makes him a hard man to put on this list. But in the games where he's out on the floor, and it's most of them, basically any time the Grizzlies are in a competitive ball game, he's playing. Even sometimes when they're not, he's playing. I mean, they got smoked by the Warriors, and he still played 32 minutes. But if it's a competitive game, he's out there, and he's seeing a lot of shot attempts because he's one of their own, one of their only real scorers. So he has similar issues to these other score-first guys we've talked about. The difference, at least in my estimation with Brooks, is that the volume really doesn't seem like it's looking at drying up. I mean, he's taking 12 to 18 shots pretty much every game, and the reason his season average sits at 12 is because there's been these two or three near goose eggs blended in when they got creamed by the Magic or dominated by the Nuggets or beaten like a, <laughs> a beaten like a drum by the Mavericks. Basically, the three games the Grizzlies got positively destroyed were the three games that Dylan Brooks didn't see many minutes, missed his shots, or didn't take that many. There's a very one simple one-to-one -one correlation here. So he's very much uh, belongs on fantasy teams. He's not available in many. Uh, but if he is, throw him on at least the end of your bench. You know, he's worth using for points. Uh, some threes. Yeah, I mean, he's around two per game. That's actually more than I realized. He's going to get you a steal because he's out on the floor a lot. And he's going to fall sort of nose first into a couple of assists just because, again, he's out there a ton. Top 100 type of guy. End of the bench. I'd rather have Terrence Ross if you gave me the choice between the two, especially with the Magic needing more shots now. But they actually profile pretty similarly. And then for some reason, I don't know why I did this, I put Nemanja Bialica on the hold list. There's no reason anybody should have been dropping him, but we got word this week that Marvin Bagley's not that far off, and that'll be when you drop him. Finally, the watch list, guys. We already gave you Kai Bowman. Here's the rest of them. Scott Labissier, who we saw play very well yesterday, but again, I mean, there's a white side factor, and it's a big one. If you want to pick him up and get ready to bench him if we find out white side is a go, in Portland's next ball game, by all means, go ahead. Uh, but and if Whiteside sits, you can throw him into your lineup. We talked about Dante DiVincenzo early in today's podcast. He's a 14 or deeper or just a streaming type, or you can just put him on your watch list, which is where we have him here on this show. Patty Mills is on my watch list. Much as I hate what the Spurs are doing, it's not our choice what they're doing. And right now, Pop seems like he wanted to get Patty Mills' energy into the starting lineup. Here's my issue. Number one, he had the sixth highest volume on the team despite playing 30 minutes with the starting unit, and he's not going to make four three-pointers every game. The upside with Mills is that if he remains in the starting lineup with Bryn Forbes and DeMar DeRozan and LaMarcus Aldridge and Jakob Pertl, there's going to be assists for him that he isn't seeing with the second unit. 
In the second unit, is get in there and gun. In the first unit, there's going to be a lot of ball movement. Or some, maybe not a ton. But he's got scorers around him. Forbes, DeRozan, Aldridge. He's on the floor with better basketball players. So the assists go up. The usage goes down. The question is, can anything else be enough to warrant a pickup? And after one game, the answer to me is no. But the minutes were big. He doesn't see that. I mean, this that was his season high in minutes played. And the other times he's gotten anywhere near 30 minutes, he's had either two or three three-pointers. And then remember way back at the beginning of the month, uh, he had 31 points on 6-3. So he can definitely wake up and get going. 30 minutes, he might get himself onto that list of Marvin Thad guys where eh, he's out there for 30 minutes. He's going to hit you almost three three-pointers a game. And as you know, we described it with Dylan Brooks, if he falls face first into three assists, there you go. But for now, watch list. I have no way to know if he's going to be in their starting lineup in the next game. Jakob Pertl I talked about after that one. He's on my watch list as well. I did pick him up in one or two spots where I'm in a league where I think I'm probably going to have to punt threes, just a weird draft and a weird set of keepers. And if you're punting threes, then obviously a guy like Pertl gets a, a nice bump because he's never going to hit one. Rebounds, steals, blocks, field goal percent. You just hope he doesn't take any free throws. But he's a watch list for most standard league teams. DeAndre Hunter is on a watch list. I know he had one big game, but otherwise his fantasy numbers are crushing our souls. He does too many things poorly. It's easy to overlook the negative impact stats when the positive impact ones look better, but please don't forget, especially in Roto, that's brutal. Shaq Harrison is on the watch list. He had a really nice ball game his last time out for Chicago, but they do have a lot of people on the shelf. The question is, could he, like, say, a Daniel Tice, play his way into a bigger role? My guess is probably not. Which is why he's on the watch list and not anything better than that. He's getting added in some places. He'll get dropped in those same places here shortly. He played 26 minutes in their last game at 15, 11, 5, 3 steals, a block, and a three-pointer. And prior to that, over the entire season, he hadn't played 26 minutes. Chandler Hutchinson was out. Otto Porter's obviously out for a while, so there's a narrow window here. I'm probably not diving in. You guys are going to hate me for the next one, but I, Kobe White is a watch list guy for me. I know that everybody's got him. Uh, well, not everybody. He got picked up in a bunch of spots, and then he got dropped again, which, I mean, it's always going to happen with guys like this. He has those big games, and then things level off. The problem with a guy like Kobe White, number one, Rookie guard. Rookie guards almost always struggle to post fantasy value in nine category leagues. Generally, the turnovers are high. Generally, this, the percentages are bad. And for White, he hasn't shown the ability to get a ton of steals or blocks. In fact, I don't think he has a single block this season. So not that you'd expect it out of a point guard, but you're just throwing it out there. Three pointers. That's really the only thing he's done well so far. He needs a ton of minutes to get to fantasy value, and he's not going to get them in a three-point guard rotation. So he's the watch list for me. Last watch list guy is Corey Joseph. I have almost no hope that this is something that's actually going to persist, but he did have a good ball game last time out. He's questionable, by the way, for their game tonight, so that might take him off our list anyway. But since De'Aaron Fox went down, he's played 38, 23, 26, and 39 minutes. Uh, had a 14 assist game his last time out. The question really that goes through my mind is, can he learn his teammates fast enough for this to be relevant? I'd say no. He's on the watch list, but the answer is probably no. Also, Buddy Heald was sick for that game, so he saw a little bit more playing time. Uh, he has also blocked seven shots in his last five games. That's not going to hold all season long. So Corey Joseph is on the watch list, but barely. The look ahead. We're at the look ahead portion of the proceedings. Guys, remember, I know I've said it already, but sign up for the Bruise Letter and hit me up if you got if you want to be involved here at Hoop Ball, especially on the sales side. Charlotte is at Washington. Uh, keeping an eye on Miles Bridges, who's been playing better for the Charlotte Hornets. 
I'd say Nick Batum, but I think we have a pretty good idea of what he's going to be doing this year. And the answer is very little. He's hit exactly one three-pointer in uh, each of his three games since coming back from injury. Uh, He has 20 rebounds in those games, and he has 13 assists, but he's literally doing nothing. He's doing nothing. I haven't... uh, This is like Shane Battier level not getting into the box score type of stuff. So, I mean, you can put him on the watch list if you want, but I'm not. Washington side, you know, it's all just about minutes and touches and stuff like that, so it's nothing specific there. Atlanta, Detroit... Not a whole lot going on. I think, you know, some curiosity on the Detroit side of how much Luke Kennard is going to be allowed to do with the team healthy. Sacramento is in Brooklyn. Fantasy-wise, I don't think there's a whole lot here we're patrolling. Miami, Chicago, uh, same old story for the Heat. Can anybody outside of the core dudes get over the hump? Chicago, I'd really just love to see Lowry Markin and not stink. I know we talked about him as a buy-low guy, but... Whoa, where the, I mean, let's, let's get it going. Spurs, Sixers. We have to see DeJounte Murray in this one, don't we? Pretty weird. Well, keep an eye on the Spurs. Obviously, their number of guys, watch list, hold guys on uh, that we just talked about. Lakers are uh, in Oklahoma City. This is on the tail end of their home and home. Lakers four-point road favorites. The uh, Thunder kind of fought tooth and nail in that last one. Question is, do they have another one of those in the tank? These are these are tough ones when you sort of you gauge how the first one went. I think the Thunder played pretty well in this game. I would actually have a lean in their direction from a gambling perspective. Cleveland, Dallas, I would assume that Tristan Thompson's back after a rest day for the Mavs. This is it, man. Prove to me that anybody besides the main two dudes can have fantasy value or I'm just going to give a drop order on all of them. Boston, Denver, playing in Denver's tough. They're good defensively. You're at altitude. I wouldn't expect a ton from your Boston Celtics in this one. Golden State, Utah, I mean, it's all the weirdos for the Warriors, and uh, we know what to do with Utah. Houston and the Clippers, I would assume that we're going to be getting game two now of the uh, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard stuff. And with Houston, it's just a matter of, you know, who's actually healthy enough to go. I wish it was Daniel House. I believe he's considered doubtful. For this ball game. So again, we're 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 in a part of the season where there are a little bit of a, a lull from a fantasy standpoint. Or we're looking for guys that are potentially coming off injury, little things that pop up here and there, starting lineup changes, stuff like that. But I'm gonna say that for this Friday card, uh Dallas, San Antonio, probably the two teams you want to keep an eye on, but no official homework for the Friday games. I don't know if I said Saturday, I meant Friday. Uh Saturday is another big card. That's 10 again. Phoenix, Minnesota. Uh, Mikhail Bridges, obviously. Mikhail Bridges is the guy you're watching in that one. We already talked about Chicago Charlotte. Orlando in the, the post-Vooch Aaron Gordon portion of the proceedings. It's just going to, I mean, they're going to get destroyed for a little bit here because Vooch is their everything. They were actually starting to play better prior to those injuries. But you're going to get a lot from the other guys. Indiana, again, it all just comes down to who the hell is healthy enough to play. Nice to see uh, Miles Turner getting his feet back underneath him. Knicks, we talked about the Spurs already. They're not super curious about New York these days. I just I want Julius Randle to learn how to make a shot from almost any place consistently. Toronto, Atlanta, not much there. Miami, Philly, we covered them. Portland, uh, hopefully Dame is back for that game tomorrow. We shall see. And obviously, uh, Whiteside and the Scal stuff. Lakers, Grizz, Detroit, Milwaukee, New Orleans, Utah. Again, a lot of that just comes down to health. And then with Sunday, uh, you're talking about teams that we've already gone over as well. So that's kind of how we're prepping for the weekend. There's a a few key teams to watch for. I don't know that we're going to be doing any rapid-fire ad drop recommendations mid-game. That type of stuff has sort of passed for the first part of the year. But don't worry, we'll get another one of those waves here coming up in the not-too-distant future. From a betting standpoint, Lakers-Oklahoma City is an interesting one. I do have a lean towards the Thunder. And if you'd like to know more about what the revenge games are for the day, you can check out our premium layup line at HoopBall. All of that goes in there with other betting thoughts from myself, Aaron Bruski, and the great Neil Rochlani. That brings us to the end of the proceedings. All three portions done. Once again, I am at Dan Bespris on Twitter. If you're enjoying Fantasy NBA Today, I ask you, please drop a five-star review on the podcast. Go to the podcast app on your mobile device, search for Fantasy NBA Today, click on the show title, not an episode, and scroll to the bottom, and you can flick a little five-star on this bad boy. It continues to help us push up the charts 
and grow and grow and grow, and we can't do it without you. So thank you so, so much. Also very easy to do it on iTunes. And I'll say today, if you've done it already, hugs and kisses to you. See if you can grab maybe your uh, spouse's phone. Do it on that one. Let's, uh, let's, let's double dip. Thanks again, everybody. This is Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation, uh, hoop ball newsletter, hoop-ball.com slash newsletter, or hit me up if you want to join our new spanking new sales team, Team Hoop Ball at hoop-ball.com, or again, get me on Twitter. Have a great weekend, everybody. Back with you Monday. Reverse chronological lightning round right around the corner. Toodaloo. This has been a Hoop Ball presentation.